freedom, happiness. Brilliant. We're back online. We're back online. <laughs> that wonderful Zoom voice. Um, welcome back if you are watching on Zoom. You may well be. Um, they've been they've been redefined, haven't they? And that's obviously the move of postmodernism that basically saying that you know the language that is important, and if we use a different use different words, um, then we will um then we will win the battle so in a cultural cultural wars at this kind of cultural war level not at the individual level of my 16 year old child in a and e who's cutting her wrist but at a cultural broad level it's about redefining language you know love is love you know that, that's why these phrases are repeated over and over again um and of course the self is really what's going on here and i would say that you need to go, actually, the sexual revolution is one thing, but what lies behind all of that is a whole, really, a theology uh, of, of self. Um, that's the key. So the first and greatest commandment in our culture is not love God, you know, uh, there, is, there is only one God, but it's be true to yourself. Mm. And the second greatest commandment is you need to affirm whatever self that your neighbor decides to be true to. So if you just say that's this is my true self, then the second greatest comment is I need to affirm you. And if you don't, then you're the sinner. So, you know, religion is alive and well, um, you know, it's just sort of shifted over to this uh, this religion of self. Um, and rather than repentance in response, the response is actually, you know, you reaffirm if someone challenges you, you reaffirm who you really are. And so if you're a Christian walking into this and you're saying, well, actually, to be a Christian means um, that sex is only within marriage, you know, um, it just makes no sense to people. And I think that's one thing, a real take home point, I would say to us. Um, and if you're a Christian today, and you're thinking, why, why do I feel such an alien? Why do I feel so different in this culture? It's because it doesn't make any sense, because in our culture, your sexuality and expressing your sexuality is crucial for expressing who you are. I mean, it's absolutely vital. And a, and a good friend of mine who is um, a same-sex attracted guy, um, he's a doctor, work with him. And he was recently in a conversation with some of our colleagues and he got an absolute rollicking from one of these doctors who was absolutely mad at him for being a Christian and for saying, no, I'm, I'm living a celibate lifestyle. I don't, you know, I don't sleep around. I'm, you know, I, I probably won't have sex for the rest of my life. And she laid into him in front of lots of other people. She said, it's outrageous. It's dehumanizing. You know, you're, you're harming yourself. It was, it was, it was awful really. Um, and he went away obviously feeling like he's, he struggles sometimes in Christian community. <laughs> And now he's been rejected by some of his friends and colleagues. Very challenging. And so sex in our culture isn't seen as a way to honour God, to, to bring new life into being in, in that sense. And they might say, well, if that's your choice, if that's what you want to do, then that's OK. But, but actually, the belief is that sex is really about self-realisation. It's about becoming who you really are. Um, and the word we kind of use for that is expressive individualism. If you've heard that, it's like this is who I am, and I need to, I need to express it. Um, and your identity as a person is found in your desires. Now, it's not found in your duty. It's not found in your, you know, the fact that you are a male, you're a husband, you're a father, whatever, whatever, whatever. It's found in your desires. If this is what you desire, then that's where your identity is. And if you work with young people. I would say this is a key battleground. How do I find out who I really am? You know, do I, do I get it from my tribe? Do I get it from my parents and who they are and who, how I've grown up? Or do I get it from my achievements in terms of, am I gonna be a doctor or a lawyer or whatever that is? Or am I gonna actually find it inside myself? And that's why a lot of young people are landing on the gender thing because that's what's been painted as the answer. It's about how you feel. And if you don't feel like you're a man, then it doesn't matter what your body speaks to you. What's more important is how you feel. And that trumps biology. And, and if you're of a, a, an older generation, shall I say, you, you might be sitting here thinking it's crazy. People, I've heard people use that word. I just don't get it. How can feelings trump external reality? But that's where we are. The power of words, the power of this is how I feel is, is trumping you know, what, what in the past would have said is just physical, biological reality. Um, so does that make sense so far? 
Yeah. Okay. So it's, it's a really interesting, and, and I want to say really from the front, that it's a really interesting, but also really exciting situation we're in because the gospel speaks to our identity and there are wonderful conversations to be had with young people, with older people about who we are and how we define who we are and where real flourishing and life comes from because the way that society presents who we are is it's all reduced to your sexuality it's very reductionist it's very much like well it's just about your sexuality it's just how you feel and it's very narrow and the christian answer as we'll come to a bit later is it's much broader and holistic and i believe life-giving but it's a difficult road difficult road to tread um so I think we, we have a challenge in our churches. Um, I'm not being specific about any one church, but we have a challenge about how we address this, how we speak into this. Um, I think a lot of churches in our nation, to be fair to say, have bought into expressive individualism. So the preaching, the teaching can be around, well, if you come to Jesus, this is how he'll kind of meet your needs. This is how he'll make you feel. And if this is how you're feeling, then he'll, he'll meet those needs. Um, and we need to be aware of that. And think about how we're, we're teaching uh, and preaching in our churches as well. Um, and I've mentioned, I put Frozen on there just because, you know, it's just, I watch a lot of Disney with my kids because uh, they're that age. But, but it is in popular culture. You know, you know, Elsa is the perfect example of someone who's got these feelings, she doesn't know what to do with them, she thinks she should hold them up, she's been repressed by her family and everyone else, but actually if she just lets it go and just expresses who she really is, then actually she'll find the way to true contentment anyway. You can go on with that in most Disney sort of Disney films, um, it's there, so it's the, it's the backdrop to people's lives, they don't question it, it's just, it just is how, how we think. Uh, where are we heading? I mean, I think it's really hard to tell. We're heading in lots of different directions all at once. Um, we're seeing a lot of backlash. So in some senses, I mean, I, I work in the trans side of things. You've got someone like Maya Forstarter who heads up um, quite an influential alliance. She's just won a court case against a former uh, an employer in the US because she tweeted about basically saying, you know, I believe biological men are men and biological women are women. Um, so that, but there's a lot of backlash, uh, and I would say a lot of it's quite ugly. Um, so it's quite an interesting place to be as a Christian and potentially a lonelier place. Um, because I think we will see a lot of backlash against trans. We're seeing it with the with children, so some encouragements. They've closed down the Tavistock. There was a big review going on. Uh, there will be changes, but a lot of it is very ugly. Um, and a lot of people who may agree with Christians, you know, traditional Christian views, and not necessarily agreeing in other ways. So all I would say is we're, we're heading in an interesting direction. We need God's help. Um, there are some encouragements, um, but there are some challenges as well. Um, I'll just briefly, just before we get into groups and just discuss some of how we might respond, I just want to outline a couple of things that are just behind um, this. And I've, I've touched on some of these things um, already. Um, and, and one is kind of ideas. We just have to recognise that ideas are incredibly powerful and it was Martin Luther King who said if you want to change the world then pick up your pen and write and a lot of our, the big thinkers through the 60s and 70s have uh, have influenced where we're at now so radical feminist thoughts you know Judith Butler's and others of this world who have um, sort of brought into this uh, teaching into our culture um, particularly around the patriarchy um, and the diminishment of women and I think again we have to recognize that in some of these things, it can be a nugget of helpful truth. And I always say to even my most staunch um, opponent, so I was at this, I was giving a evidence at um, a government hearing on gay conversion therapy. And one of there's a, somebody from another agency who vociferously disagrees with me. Um, but what I found amazing speaking to him was the passion with which he felt about the injustice towards people like him. He'd been brought up in a religious home and he felt he'd been, anyway, a big, big story and very sad story. And I think that, I don't wanna to get too much into response, but just to say that ideas are powerful, but often the people holding them have got a real desire to change things for the better. They see an injustice and they go for it. And there's times when I speak to guys like this guy I, I spoke with and I think, 
we need more Christians like this. Like we need people who have got who believe something and they're they're ready to go for it and they're ready to, in a costly way. Um, and I admire a lot of them, and I admire and, and I appreciate some of the challenges to particularly around the roles of men and women that actually some of feminist thought has brought. So I'll just I'll just say that. So there's some there's always time when we can stand and say, okay, I appreciate there's a nugget maybe in there. There's something good. There's something godly in there even. But actually, there's a lot that isn't and a lot that's very harmful and, and destructive. So that's very true. Gnosticism is the idea that your body and your mind are separate. That is absolutely rife. It's come back. It's the idea that, um, yeah, you know, your body's kind of really irrelevant to who you really are. It's kind of you can morph your body. And with technology, we can now change our bodies incredibly. Um, and I must uh, and I'll be I won't be too too graphic about this. But what doctors can do with human anatomy is quite incredible. Uh, to the point where I was fooled as a first year junior doctor, not fooled, but actually, actually seeing a, somebody who I thought was a female who was actually a male who transitioned and had surgery. It's, it's incredible. So that, that with technology and, and, and so on, people think, well, I can change my body. It's just a canvas for the soul. So Gnosticism is, is rife and, and it's, it's got the ability to, to, run, to, to run a mock. Um, I'll skip over a quote for it. And, and it's, as I've mentioned, it's a moral cause. So there's a morality behind this. Queer theory. Yes, and I can talk about queer theory. So queer theory is, is, is huge among the sexual revolution. Um, and it's basically saying, you know, gender categories are social constructs. So it's basically being all being constructed to support the kind of cis heteronormative, this is what they talk about, this kind of idea that, you know, families, you've got a man and a woman and children, and it's all being constructed. So that's why you can say, the midwife, you know, um, assigned this person their sex at birth. So that's the language being used. And so it is quite difficult to get your head around because it's really saying that, no, 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 physical reality, we just assume that's what divides us into male and female, for example. No, 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 but we've, we've used our language constructs to do that. So it's a very, it's a very stark way of, of addressing the issue. Um, yeah, and we need to kind of throw all that stuff off and find out who we really are inside. So that's queer theory. Yeah, so that's, um, yeah, it, it is. Although queer theory is probably the, the idea that overarches all of it. Um, the Q and is a, is a little bit more about I, I, I'm queer, I'm gender queer means that I have different ways of seeing. So it draws from the theory into reality. Um, I mentioned it's, it's a moral it's a moral cause, um, and we need to be to recognise that as well. And that there's narrative power. Um, so really, this is all told as stories, um, and it's very easy as Christians to say, okay, we're going to get up and, and, and preach a sermon, or I'm going to give you all the statistics about loneliness. I mean, the stats are outrageous. I mean, if you look at where we were and where we are now, you look at statistics on, uh, you know, fatherless families on. Uh, just on almost everything, I can quote lists of statistics that would say the Christian view of, you know, of this is better, you know, um, but it doesn't cut mustard because you're arguing against a story. And when stories are woven into popular culture about how we were so oppressed, you know, in the past, we had this Christian ethic and it was so repressive for women. And the, again, there's that little nuggets of truth there where people say, yeah, okay, actually, there were some of the 1950s kind of way we did life was, was a bit, was repressive. Um, but there's been, you know, we need to express ourselves. And there's been this fight and this fight, we've got heroes and examples who have, who have gone before us and we worship and, you know, we, we recognize their, their sacrifice and, and they've been hard won these rights. But there's a danger, particularly the religious people coming in and taking us back to the bad old days. So you get these narratives that are woven into, um, are woven in. And so in a sense, we need to tell a better story. We're not here just to quote lots of stats. We're here to, to tell um, a better story. Um, and I did say we're about to, to break into groups, we generally are. But I just want us to be reminded of the first sexual revolution, if you like. So we, we talked about the sexual revolution of the 50s and the 60s. Um, but actually, go back to Roman times and... Okay, so there's some differences, but in, in the Roman sexual ethic, there are a lot of similarities to today. And of course, the arrival of Christianity completely turned on its head the way that uh, sexual ethics were viewed. Um, and of course, you know, basically in that culture, it was a power dynamic culture. It was around social status. If you had social status, 
you had power over somebody else and that included sexually so if you're if, particularly if you were a male if you owned slaves and so on you could basically force yourself on, on whoever you wanted um but of course in that culture this, this christian ethic this christian what was seen as a rep repressive you know narrow uh, sexual ethic it won over and it particularly attracted women uh to to the you know to to the to the movements um and the, the reason for that is because the the world the, the world view around around sex as, as christians proposed it in that time was so much more positive um, and humane it protected uh, women and children in particular because in, in sort of greco-roman times if you're a woman or a child you were the bottom of the pile um, and you were not always treated uh, very well and and we just is seeing that every culture we're in has a sexual morality um, and it's grounded in the beliefs of what sex is for and again this is a this is the thing i always say if you're a parent or if you if you're an aunt or an uncle and so on it's teaching our children not just what sex is, not just the birds and the bees talks, which is, by the way, I've got a whiteboard at home and I've got B and B talk for one of my children, which is to remind me that I need to have a chat with him. Um, but it's not just that; it's it's what is it for? Like, why did why is sex here? What 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 is it? What is it all about? So, is it about um, as it was in Roman times, just asserting yourself and actually showing about what a power relationship? Or is it more about something else? And the Christian sexual ethic says the, the sexual act is about keeping you in a right relationship with God um, and with God's created order. Um, it's basically, it says it's not just an appetite that we can't control, but a joyous and sacred expression of how God orders the world. And we, we still have these roots of, of the first sexual revolution in our culture. Um, and so these, you know, these, the, the idea of, of consent and the idea that actually um, it's about sex is about two parties and both need to be respected. That's not very Roman. That comes from a Christian sexual ethic. It's still it's still there, if you like. Um, you know, Paul said the husband's body doesn't belong uh, to himself, but to his wife, just as the wife belongs to her husband. That statement was radical. In that society, that would that would have been met with the same quizzical. Huh? What do you mean? As we sometimes will meet our current sexual revolution, and so this idea of, of in, you know of rights for each individual is actually borrowing Christian belief. Uh, and there's times when it's appropriate to gently ask people, "Well, why is that? Why do you even think that's okay? Where does that come from? Where does your belief in equal rights and consent actually come from?" And then secondly, actually, we need to recognise that the modern movement is actually a step backwards. This is tough to argue uh, with people, but actually it's, it's saying, and the way I sort of put it is, well, we've broken the link between sex and God. Of actually it being about God, it being about who God is and how he's made us. And it's going back to the social order. It's going back to self-fulfillment. It's about me. It's about making, you know, boosting my position, um, if you like. Um, and so sexual culture today can be can be quite depersonalizing, quite objectifying, you know, people using one another as objects, basically, to, to find, meet their needs, uh, their felt needs. Uh, and of course, we don't even need people these days. You know, pornography has meant that you don't even need another person, but you can objectify others through uh, the means of, of pornography. Um, and, you know, and I think today a lot of stories are that people feel used. Um, Hookup culture <laughs> leads to people a lot of loneliness, a lot of brokenness um, in people's lives. And while in the short run, self-control, the Christian sexual ethic is difficult. Les mentioned it this morning, didn't he? You know, this idea of just running away. That can be hard. That can be inconvenient. That can be costly. It can be difficult. You know, running away from things, can, can it, it takes effort and energy. But in the long run, the Christian sexual ethic is more fulfilling um, and less dehumanizing. And we need to think about how we talk about that truth in ways that, that people can see and they can say, I love that. And a lot of that is about how we live. It's about how we live as a church. It's about how we live as, in marriages, but how we live as single folk. It's about how we welcome people in who are 
who are caught up in a lot of these ideologies and thoughts without even realizing it and showing them that the biblical uh, sexual ethic is is wonderful it may be hard but it's the way to life so why don't we just pause if you just turn to the person next to you and just um maybe just reflect on a couple of things what i've said um and i just want some ideas really from the floor really in, a, in about two or three minutes how do we demonstrate this how do we speak this to people around us to our friends families people we work with all right so a few minutes together if you want to ask a question anonymously pop it on slido or we'll have a q a in a minute Okay, should we come back together? Is there anything from your discussions that you'd like Hello? to share Hello? just with all of us? I've got mine. If you want to... Uh, no. Any comments or questions? Mark's got a microphone. He can come to you for that. So. Oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> great. Um, it's, it's not more of a question for me and how I deal with um, this topic. I'm a stay-at-home mum. 
before, but it's more to do with how you teach your children who are in high school at the moment and how they cope when they basically manage with the discussion of all this going on. I've got three kids already in high school and one who's going in September and it's the biggest discussion yeah. across the board of change of what's happening in the school and they, they put on these PSC lessons for the kids that are the world topics they talk about yeah. abortion or Black Lives Matter but this is the one that comes up the most yeah. and in most of the sessions or global warming there is allowed to be a discussion and a debate between the kids but in yeah. this one there is no discussion okay. no debate yeah. and my kids don't have a voice my son says to me I'm silence and you're not yeah. allowed to in front of them yeah Mm-hmm. you're not allowed to have a difference of opinion in mm-hmm. front of the teacher or your other friends and mm-hmm. it's really hard they find mm-hmm. it they find it difficult yeah. and I've got my 11 year old now going my eldest is in sixth form and he's seen half of his class is LGBTQ yeah. okay. and I don't know how my daughter's going to manage going up this year because mm-hmm. considering it's getting worse mm-hmm. yeah. and um yeah it's hard because I it's the biggest discussion in our home because they come home every day yeah. and it's like mom how do I do this how do I do that what do I say yeah. what do I do yeah so mm-hmm. and a lot of these kids are self-harming yeah. loads of them are slitting their wrists and are unhappy and they've got really sad stories yeah it's true so, it, it is incredible yeah and I think your your situation is repeated just multiple times over um and I, I, I'm having Christian parents come to me with with their kids and say, what do I do? And, you know, can you speak with them? And it's, it's, um, it is tragic. Um, I think that we need to, so I, I know some parents who are making a decision to say like, I'm actually removing my children from this situation, this, it, because it, the way it's becoming, because there is no dissent uh, allowed um, and, and it's, it's becoming, it's not education anymore. It's becoming something more. So I, I am seeing some parents saying we need to form new institutions back big back to christian schools and so on so we've got that that camp i've got other a lot of other parents who are saying no we're not we're not there yet and we're going to keep going but actually it means that um the way that we model life in church and the redoubling efforts to be connecting their children in community to connecting them with other young people who are from families who may hold the same view doesn't mean they will necessarily because there's people from christian families who are grappling with these things as well um, but actually, I think in our teaching, it needs to start, sadly, needs to start younger than we'd ever hope. Mm-hmm. The conversation, so my, my B&B's talk is for my, you know, my eight-year-old. Yeah. And it makes me sad. Yeah. It makes me sad. Yeah, our 11-year-old has had so much more of this in primary school this last two years than our, uh, since COVID more than our other kids ever did. And they're in a little church primary school. Yeah. So already I'm like, oh my goodness, I've got to talk to you about yeah. this it's so heartbreaking speaking, though isn't it, it? Is there's supposed to be think, kids and they're yeah. not allowed to be anymore yeah. and i think so. talking about it early and talking about people and i'm sure you do this but talking about these young people with with respect with compassion we're talking about how they're obviously you know and my, my kids can see it so when we say and i don't quite say it like this but it's along the lines of well how's that working out how is that internal identity narrative where how I feel, how's that working out? Well, often it's not working out very well. Uh, and just gently just pre- probing that. And I think a key for me has been uh, the questions uh, as we as we teach our children to answer these questions. So what is sex for? We need to be able to teach that. Why did God make sex? What is gender for? Why did he make us male and female? What's it all about? And that is that's where the wonderful opportunity comes in, because we're connecting this to God's plan for the whole of creation. Amen. This is about Christ and the church. This is about God's cosmic purposes. And it, that sounds a bit ethereal, but we can really root it in the gospel and 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 seeking to show its good news is challenging because the constant narrative, you know, sexual Christian sexual ethic is repressive. And that's where in the, it's going to be a long game. But in the long run, I'm confident that like in the third century that christianity will win through but there's going to be casualties along the way and our kids are in the middle of it yeah. but we need to be teaching them what, what it's for um and saying what you know a, a better version of what it means to be human and show our kids that actually it's so reductionistic to talk about sex and that, that's all that i am but actually i'm far more than that and my identity is far and ultimately our identity is received from god this is who god says you are God said, and this is what I repeat time and again, particularly with my daughter, just gently over the years, 
you know, you're a girl. God loves God. Not quite you're a girl, but you know, God loves you. You know, you're you're precious. You know, and and just and the way I speak to my boys, yeah. you know, it's constant. It's you know, yes, God's made you a boy. He's made you know. And without trying to stereotype them, because it can be very easy. We have to be careful of that um, because our children are not always fit those stereotypes. And it is often the sensitive for boys. It's the sensitive, shy. I don't quite fit in socially. I don't feel very macho. And if if we load on them. Okay, you know, this is what it means to be a man. You've got to play rugby um, to be a man, whatever it is. That will just load on them more stereotypes. Um, and I have, I, I'll, I'll be honest, I've had, uh, it was, a, I'll say, it was a South African friend of mine with some boys. And one was a, just looked like his dad, rock solid rugby player. The other one liked his dance. And he said to me, oh, I just, I just can't wait for him to get into rugby and really be a man. I stopped him and I said, no, he's just as much of a man oh, in his dancing, uh, you know, as, as you want him to be a member of the Springboks. That's not going to happen, but you need to affirm him yeah. as a man. Yeah. Okay. And that's the big challenge for us as well. We could talk more about that. I've just, I saw another question. Is that okay? Um, or comment? Yeah, you follow on. Sorry, thank you. It just relates to what you were saying, just from personal experience. My daughter um, is 15 and she has, um, in the last term at school, she was extremely bullied because she was Christian and she had gay friends in school. And they basically turned around to her, they turned on her and said, you hate us because we're gay. You're a Christian. They know her dad's a pastor. Um, and they said, you hate us because we're gay. Um, and they turned her whole year group against her. She had all the year group coming up to her saying, why do you hate these people? Why do you hate these people? Um, and she was basically on her own. Um, and she's like, and she said, I don't hate you. This is not about hate. This is not about whether I like you or don't like you. This is about my values. And, and I think one of the things I think you touched on it, John, is going back to the creation story. Yeah. God made men and women. God made it like this. And we taught her that, you know, she knew that from an early age. And she was able to share that with them. I don't hate you. I love you. And we were talking about this, about the unconditional love that we need to show. And she did exactly that. She said, I love you as a friend, but I don't agree with your, your thoughts and your values. She said, but that doesn't make me not your friend. And um, it went on and on and on. It basically turned into mass bullying. She basically, they basically turned the whole year group on my daughter and it turned into bullying and, and the school did nothing. They weren't interested because like culture, they believe that, you know, what's wrong? You know, what's wrong with, you know, these girls being gay, they're allowed to be who they want to be. And that, you know, that's their choice. But my issue came when the school did nothing. Yeah. And I think if, and I said to them, and I said, I went to the school um, because I'm a teacher, so I kind of know how the system works. I went to the school and, if ta and I said to them, if tables were turned and, you know, my daughter had said something about them being a different religion or a different race or a different ethnic group, I said she would have got in serious trouble. But because Christianity is now set, and I think we were discussing this yesterday, seen as soft, yeah. it's just brushed over. And I would not have it with the school. And they were like, we, you know, we'll talk to the girl, we'll talk to them, you know. And I was like, no, that's not good enough. Mm -hmm. This is bullying and harassment yeah. for my yeah. daughter because of her beliefs and because of her faith. Yeah. And eventually they weren't going to get her parents involved. And I was like, no, you contact her parents and you tell their parents that their daughter, yeah. what their daughter is doing, because they won't, regardless of what sex she is, what gender she is, what she identifies as, it's bullying yeah. but my daughter just a long way around to your story but my daughter was able to minister the creation story to them yeah. this is what i believe and this is why i believe that men and women should be together and you know and, and love and how god god's order what you were saying was before so i think from a young age and i think you know sad as it is we need to teach them about god's order and the creation yeah. story in order for them to have the knowledge and the understanding to be able to say to people when they're challenged this is why because unfortunately teenagers they don't they don't want it they like to take what they see they take it on face value you know they see something on social media and they believe it you know i think that's just how the teenage brain works because they're not mature enough to kind of dissect it look into it and research it um so we need to teach our children from a younger age about the basics of christianity what we believe what god says in order for them to go into school because I'm a secondary school teacher and it's difficult it's so difficult 
Um, but if we equip our children with that knowledge and that understanding, I think it puts them in a better position. Yeah, that's wonderful. Thank you very much. Steve, I said we'd get some answers from <laughs> you guys. That's fantastic. And I think just to say that, they, that you're so right about going back to creation story. I mean, back when I was growing up, we started in Genesis 3. Like, we just, uh, you, are, you are a sinner and people, you know, that was the way. But actually, nowadays, we've got to go right back to the beginning, not only with non-Christians, but also you know, I think with our children in our churches, you know, why, why are we here? What, what are we made for? And I think every, every time I speak about sexuality, um, I'm, I always kind of go back that way because because people often think, oh, we're kind of, kind of the same Christians. No, we kind of see the world, but you Christian, you've got a bit of a weird thing about gay sex. Mm. Yeah. And you target us. And, and you know what? We have to own some of the stuff that's gone on in the past. We have to own the fact that at times, um, and I know people in this situation, where the people have been victimized uh, because they because of their, their same sex attracted. And we've got to own that. And we've got to be ready to say, but 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 that, that's what people say. Yeah, we're just the same, but you just have a weird view on so in fact it's harmful. And it's so harmful that that's why we don't tolerate any dissent. That's why there's no debate about it. But every time I talk, I say we need to work out the purpose of the universe. Why are we here? Is it about me and my desires and meeting my desires, or is it about something else? And actually, when we start to talk about it, it's something else, like, you know, it's about Jesus, it's about our truest identity being found in God, not in our sexual relationships, um, then actually we have different conversations. That's what I've found just with other people. I say, no, no, this isn't about sex. It's about something far bigger than that. I know the cost isn't just, we're just talking about whether I get married or not, whether I have sex. The, the whole Christian view, it's, it's far more costly than that. I mean, it's more radical than you ever, it's, it's weirder than you even think. You might think I'm weird. Tell you what. If you really want to hear the whole Christian story, it's even weirder, right? Because it is. I mean, it's, and that's, I mean, John was referring to it, you know, it's, there's times when we have to say, actually, what we believe is really radical. And the culture that we're coming up against is, is challenging us from this, yeah, I can be a Christian, I can be just the same as everyone else, live on my street, have a job. Everything is kind of the same, we'll worship and it's all fine. The culture we're in is challenging us. And it's, it's and there's a, there's crunch points and as again our kids are on the front line often more more than we are, so it's about much bigger than that. I I don't I disagree with the non-Christian world about gay sex. Yes, I do, but I disagree with the non-Christian world on almost everything. <laughs> okay, the meaning of life, that why we're here, it's far bigger than that. So we've got to tackle. I was put in one of the comments. We've got to go for the roots, not the fruits, and that's where I think Israel Folau, Dare I say it? I think he got it a bit wrong. I think going out with a tweet like he did was insensitive uh, and not helpful because he's going for the fruits, not the roots. Any other any other thoughts, comments? Yeah, did, yeah, yeah. Please. Yeah. Um, yeah, we're married, so it's the same same lad. Um, so he's he's his class is at least half um, LGBTQ, whatever it is. Um, so he and and he's living his um, living as a Christian lad. He's we, we brought them up solidly um and the issue is he doesn't fit into that category yeah. um but the the thing that that we're not covering as well um i'm sure that that you've got something to say about it is that the the other lads that are straight are just as bad mm -hmm. as all the all the gay people because the culture that we were talking about here is is it's a total free for all. Mm. Like the they're, they're, they're all sleeping with each other. Yeah. All the straight yeah. kids are sleeping with all the, yeah. the these poor young girls, yeah. and they're all just you know they're all ruining themselves for mm. for for the future. So the the whole thing's just happening far too early, mm. and and we need to like really reset the whole mm. thing and, yeah. and 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 stop and stop the because I would say that someone who 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 is like same sex attracted who's like actively gay is 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 you know you know you've got someone else who goes out and you know preys on drunk girls and goes and has sex with a different girl you know three nights of a week that's worse it's just as bad because these young girls are precious children of god that are that are being preyed on by these horrendously debauched young men who just want to get their end away it's horrendous and a lot of the stories i hear from girls who have um who have been uh, saying i want to identify as a male there's the root a lot of the root of it is there's a fear they're, they're being you know and actually they're they're they've been pre pre predated yeah been um preyed on by by these aggressive boys um, 
yeah so and then and then some of the feelings of attraction to other girls and you know understandable. it's understandable where that's come from and so yeah the art well, how do I answer this, this big but did, we're almost we're almost out of time um do we do one more comment from yeah 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 I'll try and be quick as possible um yeah I can testify to um that there's literally a lot of um controversial topics discussed at school because I grew up here um, I'm 21 so I was a Christian and abortion and Black Lives Matter and mm -hmm. sexual revolution and feminism and all these sort of things come up but I'll just say to the parents that what you can do is just pray for your children pray that they'll stand and be strong and I didn't have Christian parents mm -hmm. um but I was a Christian and it was it was really, really hard because um to say to, to try and save yourself until marriage or like my best friend is gay. We 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 um we love each other, but obviously I disagree with him on certain perspectives and he disagrees with me. There's a way to walk in um love and truth at the same time, but you have to stand firm in your convictions and in your um and in your beliefs and I think we're the soul of the we're the soul of the earth and I do feel like when you're a teenager there's a lot of peer pressure but when you reach let's say your especially if your children are like um against you if they're like for me it was the opposite opposite way around but if your children are like against you and they may see you as homophobic or transphobic because you believe what you believe, I would say just to encourage you that to stand firm on your faith and stand firm on God because you'll you'll be a great example to them and they'll thank you for it because um, there's an agenda I feel from the world organizations to push a lot of confusion mm -hmm. from starting from a young age and it's really hard to follow God because um, even in school God is seen as an author authoritarian oppressive patriarchal figure in the sky who um, dominates everyone and that used to hurt my heart like it used to hurt me so badly so I thought if you got your perspective on God wrong then probably the likelihood of all these other topics that you're trying to push over me as a you know as a black woman is probably wrong as well because just so you know I I don't support black lives matter I don't support feminism and that so where do I fit in in all of that but I follow Christ Jesus and I put kingdom of the culture. And I think that's what we should be doing as Christians. And I want to say bravo to all the parents who raised up their children in a godly way, because I wish, I wish that would have happened to me. And I think that um, a lot, just pray for your children's friends who are in this, in this whole other world. And you never know what God can do. Yeah. Thank you. So are you asking the question now i get emotional it was really a question so my um i've got an eight-year-old um we've had the birds and the bees recently um i always go back to i love my gardening god created everything and also with animals i think in the current situation in the generation children are given a lot more authority um mm. obviously being able to have these operations at such a young age if we go back to when we're allowed to work when we're allowed to have our driving license yeah. when we're allowed to have a bank account when we're giving that responsibility to contribute to society that's when we're at that age mm -hmm. so my biggest question i don't know if um anybody's in law or even as a doctor where where do they get given that authority obviously the parents have that authority mm -hmm. but children obviously you're not allowed even if your parents says i want them to have a bank account they're not allowed it until they're 16. Mm -hmm. I don't know if anybody has ever had that for or where that authority has come from mm. but I do think that in itself is a, a big area and it's mm. something that could be addressed because children even as we've just spoke from a 21 year old you go through so many changes and you're put mm. into so many things and until you get to a certain age mm. you don't have that awareness you don't have that experience mm. so I think just mm. giving that authority and again with young lads they're mm. wanting to have that authority of an adult to go with a, a young girl because they want to be in a relationship they want to do what adults do they want to to do that and again it's having that authority of i want to be grown up yeah. and they're given that authority and yeah. unfortunately children do have a lot more authority than 
unfortunately even adults again yeah, with school situations and I think it's took a big turn we just the, need to take that encouragement back. Is I think we've reached a dip and I think there was some such strong pushback onto this stuff um it mainly comes from like uh contraception it comes from being competent to you know basically have mastery over your body so when a child's 13 and up they can be gillet competent depending on whether they can understand everything and that's the challenge is is how much can a child understand um, even a 17 18 year old actually and many will turn around and say and are turning around and saying but the decisions i made then i wasn't able to fully appreciate the ramifications of my decision <clears throat> it's an encouragement i think we're going to be seeing a lot of pushback on that medically yeah. in, in sort of this in, this environment so i think there's some encouragement there but yeah, there's the sort of anti-authoritarian parental stuff is, is really key. I must say, I'm just going to pray. Um, and if you'd like to stay on and, and chat, that's fine. But I'm aware someone needs to go and get children and, and so on. So I'm just going to pray. Really sorry. I know there's other questions. Uh, but let's let's do that um, together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to meet together. Lord, just to grapple with this topic, just for under an hour. And it's it's on the big scale of, of principalities and powers and ideas and Lord, we recognize the warfare going on for souls and for human beings uh, in our culture. And we are we are devastated at the impact that it's having on people. And Lord, we recognize as well at the individual level, the pain uh, and the challenges that there are for parents um, and for, for young people in this age. And Lord, we just say that we need your wisdom and we need a move of your spirit. And we need, again, Lord, to see uh, you uh, changing lives. And Lord, as we, as we come against, we, we, we're encouraged, Lord, by seeing how through Roman times in a very uh, similar situation, how the Christian sexual ethic won the day mm. because Christians were stayed and they were faithful and they kept going and they, they were in, in loving, stable relationships. And the church was the church full of, of single and married uh, people who are saying this is all about God and this all points to something beyond sect it points to something even better mm. than the set than the sect act itself and we pray Lord that we would be found faithful that we'd be communities who demonstrate a better story who demonstrate Lord a way to to real human flourishing in all of its fullness and I pray for protection and your encouragement Lord for those in this room and others Lord who are feeling just defeated by this right whether it's personally whether it's for their children Give us wisdom, we pray. May you protect our children. May you protect those who are uh, oppressed and who are victims of this sexual revolution. And may, your, you, may you reign over our land once again. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. Thank you for coming. Please do feel free to go. I know people need to go and do things. Um, and I'm happy to chat afterwards if we need to. Thank you. Just a couple of weeks ago, so I came from the CAS report where she basically said a single hub is just not a realistic model, which we're like, yeah, we agree with that. So they've shut it. Um, so there'll be two different clinics. So there'll be one in, I think they may have one in Exeter, still discussing it, and one in Liverpool. So there's going to be two, and then there's going to be like five satellite hubs. So